Back on November 18th of last year, I was interviewed by Amali from Mother Jones about my experience with A Voice for Men as the Collegiate Activism Director and as the founder of Kennesaw State University Men. The article that was supposed to be published as a result of this interview was meant to come out a week after the interview was done, but after a long series of follow-ups and several requests from Molly for me not to publish the interview until the article was published, I finally decided now in April, almost half a year later, that this article is not going to be published. So I'm going to be publishing this interview now since Molly does understand that this recording is my own intellectual property on my end of it. So that's why I'm publishing it. There is one thing you do need to know though about this uh, recording. I There's a point where she asks me what caused me to become an MHRA and I ended up telling her a bit about my personal life and particularly my father and the suffering that he went through. And since those are personal details about, there are personal details about my father that were off the record, I bleeped out that part of the conversation. Don't worry, you're not really missing anything. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy this interview, and I hope that it will be, prove informative, especially if you are a student that wants to get kind of a feel of the environment for men's rights activism. Hello, Molly. Hey, Sage, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm well. Um... Let me just uh, take a sec to turn my recorder on. Sure. Great. Okay, our levels look good. And um, I am, we had some construction in our office today, so um, I decamped for my uh, apartment. So if you get any echo or if at some point I have to switch rooms so I don't bother my roommate, that is why. Okay. So. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time. I'm glad we could connect, and uh, especially since you've got sort of a busy week going on. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, as I said in my email, uh, I want to accomplish a, a few things in this interview. I want to learn more about your efforts to start a men's group at Kennesaw, mm -hmm. and your efforts with A Voice for Men to start similar groups at other universities. And I want to learn about uh, what you hope to, uh, you know, accomplish with KSM and other groups. And uh, get a sense of what your role um, uh, with a voice for men sort of working with these other groups is going to be. Um, and then finally, just I'd like you to talk about what the main men's issues, <laughs> excuse me, issues are when you're talking about a college campus. Uh, sounds good? Okay. Great. Um, so let's uh, cover just the biographical things real quick. Uh, you're still a student at Kennesaw, correct? Yes. And uh, what year? Junior. Junior. And how old are you? 22. 22. And um, what's your major? Computer science. Computer science. All right. Cool. Got that out of the way. Um, so yeah, let's let's just start with Kennesaw. What made you identify a, a need for a men's issues group at Kennesaw? Well, I could I guess I could start by talking about the demographic statistics. Kennesaw State University has just recently breached 70% women on campus and there are many programs on campus that are geared toward helping women in in many ways and uh, I think that a lot of these programs are effective, but I do see a very a strong lack of representation and programs for men and boys and uh, in one of my articles on Kennesaw State University that I published on A Voice for Men, I noticed that the best I could find was a a place called the Gentlemen's Club, which was a organization that was essentially a group therapy session for men and boys that uh, had a very uh, had a very suspicious twist to it, where the members were not allowed to communicate with each other outside of the group. They had to sign a form saying that they could they withdrew consent to socialize with one another without being monitored by the group therapist facilitating the uh, the place. So I wanted to have a place where students could talk about issues affecting um, themselves like high suicide rates, high dropout rates, and I could elaborate on more of that as we go on. But there was no real group for that. So KSU Men was fulfilling a, a need. Okay. Um, and yeah, so so let's talk about those issues, because my next question is, you know, what are the issues that you hope to focus on? And so, well, the first one that comes to mind al almost always is suicide rates. The uh, Dr. Miles Groth has, re has released an article on Psychology Today showing that college-age men commit suicide four times more often than college-age women. And as um, 
And there was also Dr. Warren Farrell who mentioned that as boys grow up and they start to notice uh, the kind of gender roles that they have to take on, which is a huge topic in and of itself, the suicide rate increases by an order of magnitude. And I believe the number he used was something like, I can't remember if it was 2,400% or 24,000%, but it was just enormous. Mm -hmm. And boys and men, they are under a lot of emotional pressure to conform to some sort of expectation set on them by society. And when uh, both men and women know a friend of theirs or a family member who has taken their own lives, this is a very serious issue. And the um, college age bracket, 18 to 25, this is a very dangerous time for a lot of men. So I would want to make sure that guys have a place where they can go to know that they have social support and to know that they have representation in order to, in, in some way, curb those uh, frightening numbers. And uh, so that's the very big first issue that comes to mind. And other issues I could name are uh, false convictions and uh, false allegations of, say, sexual assault, where, it, where somebody could, uh, where a man could be held uh, against, uh, could suffer violations of due process or intervention from campus security when there's no evidence that shows he's committed a crime. This is a serious issue, and one example I could give you is uh, the um, Nicholas Alaverdian case. Uh, have you been following that story? Is this the one out in Ohio that you were at? Yes, it was. Right. So I, I got a chance to glance at the coverage, but I didn't uh, get a chance to read it too carefully. Okay. Um, well, uh, ju just so you have a very brief overview, Nicholas Alaverdian was uh, accused of sexual assault, and he was brought before Judge Carl Henderson. And Judge Carl Henderson had denied him a jury trial, even though no corroborating evidence was found that Nicholas had uh, committed sexual assault. And this was a, um, it's become a big rally where we're talking about violations of constitutional rights. And this happened in a community college. So these kinds of issues, when they pop up on uh, our college campuses, it's very important that we have some kind of representation that's there to resist any any uh, problems that men could suffer from that do not have that could have a very strong adverse effect on men or the people who love these men. And, and that you know that leads into my next question, well, because yeah, um, you know, I my next question is, you know, what do you what do you hope to accomplish? And I, I guess by that I mean, um, you know, it's clear you want to educate people about these issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in what ways do you sort of really want to get uh, active? The, that's an excellent question, and in many ways there's a lot of uncertainty with this, but what I want to start doing is to hold meetings to educate the public, as you mentioned, but then I would like to go out onto into the local community and on campus, identify policies that are in some way harmful to men or are gynocentric or misandric, that is, and to find ways to change those policies. That's one fold of the bottom line. The other fold of the bottom line is to change any precedents that in some way would assume guilt on the part of men. It's a way to, um, it's just a way to make sure that uh, when, when men and boys are put in a, on a, in a very harmful position, innocence is presumed until proven guilty. And uh, if there's any policies that in some way harm men from the get-go, that those get reversed. Now, one example I could give you, so this is clearer to you, is there was another report I wrote on Kennesaw State University, again, on A Voice for Men, where I talked about a rape aggression defense course on Kennesaw State. And uh, the context behind this was that this RAD, or RAD course, was founded in 2002 after, um, in, and when, at the time, KSU had only one rape reported on campus over the uh, 1995 to 2002 period. And at the time, the course was only available to women. Ten years later, Kennesaw State University added a uh, rape aggression defense for men. But as it was presented in the Sentinel, the KSU paper, the classes were taught differently between men and women in a very concerning way. Specifically, women were taught to deal as much damage to, his attack, to an attacker as possible, whereas men were told to walk away, oh, and by the way, don't rape anybody because you will unless we tell you to, or we tell you not to. And uh, this, is a, this is a very concerning thing, and there are situations where um, men are coerced into situations where they're raped or are and need some way to get out of that, but these classes don't offer that information. And um, the gynocentric way of teaching violence to women is, and teaching 
and a way of having some sort of kind of a mental programming for men is very worrisome. So one thing that KSU men would do is say, approach the security department and say, why is it this way? Why is this happening? Why can't there be a more equal way of teaching this class? So that's one, and that's just a way to give you an example of what kinds of things we hope to change. Sure. Um, and, you know, I guess, so I'll be sort of dropping into throughout this conversation with, you know, what I would imagine sort of the response to some of these mm -hmm. uh, examples would be. Uh, and, and for that one, I, I could imagine that, you know, some folks would say that because rape is an issue that affects men and women differently and in, in with different frequency, that might be one reason why they were taught to like, in, in different fashions. Well, we um, well in, in the men's human rights movement, we factor in uh, other other incidences of rape, including uh, men who are raped in prisons and uh, victims of statutory rape. That is, young boys who are raped by teachers. And um, we have we, when we consider these issues, we notice that men and women do certainly experience rape in different ways. But we do not uh, we do still do not have the resources necessary for men to uh, protect themselves. From rape in the same ways, so that's one one area where we could offer additional representation. It, I mean, rape is a horrible thing, and we wouldn't want it to happen to anybody. But the rape aggression defense course on KSU offers seems to offer women what they need in terms of the class, in terms of what the class offers, but it does not offer men what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I I saw that you wrote or you sort of um, referred to some of the resistance that. Um, your group encountered when you first sort of brought the idea to campus. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And uh, to be and to be clear, thankfully the resistance was not as bad as, uh, say, the University of Toronto when uh, Warren Farrell went to speak over there, or uh, Catherine Yon or Paul Nathanson. Thank you. Th thankfully, it's uh, was very light in comparison to that. But the resistance I did experience was in the form of somebody writing a hate note and leaving it on uh, the the table I was using to promote KSU men. Right. And yeah. I and in the and in the and in terms of a staff member who was not working in security getting physical with me and when I was uh, recording under my rights as a student I was recording a public area somebody grabbed me and uh, I found out they were enforcing a policy that did not exist and my rights as a student were infringed upon when I was uh, going out and gathering footage for my donors the people who were funding the promotion. So they, these were the two big things that uh, I could count as resistance, but thankfully not much else. Mm -hmm. um, and how is the group going since you uh, established it? And I realize you established it very recently. Yes, so. we are still. Uh, I have. I have a. Uh, I have a treasurer, a vice president, and an advisor. The um, it's split fifty-fifty between men and women, and I frankly could not ask for a better lineup. They're very supportive, and I'm happy with it. And. I actually just came back from this month's officer meeting. We are currently finding a place for meetings to be held, and we're deciding on meeting times. And uh, we are also getting some fundraising efforts underway. And frank I, frank frankly, I think this is great. We're going to uh, – I think we'll have time for one or two meetings before the semester's over because finals are coming up and everybody's going to be really stressed out. But we're going to be picking up operations immediately in January. And at that point, we'll be getting uh, what's called CSO status on KSU, and that stands for Certified Student Organization. And when we get that status, we'll be able to reserve space and to have more authority to, say, hire speakers to come down and to uh, just, you know, have more freedom to do what we want to do on campus. So it's going great, I think. Cool. Um the fundraising is that um, would would you do that through the school? Do you have access to like the student activities budget, or is that something you're doing through a voice for men? Uh, I do not have fundraising through uh, on KSU. It's called the Student Activities and Budget Advisory Committees, or SABAC. Mm -hmm. SABAC is um, I cannot get funding through them yet. I, in order for me to get uh, funding through SABAC, I have to have an organization on campus for one full year. I can get CSO status, which is needed for funding next semester, but I have to wait till fall before they offer any money. So no, all fundraising has to go through uh, the uh, KSU Men website, which is um, f which is found uh, on a WordPress instance. Mm -hmm. And you know, wordpress.com, there's a KSU Men site there and there's just a donate button. That's where all the donations come in. And uh, then of course, during meetings, we'll just pass a basket around. And then right. we'll do like bake sales or table events, some just some traditional ways to get some money. 
Are there like specific things you want to raise money for yet? You mentioned you want to bring speakers to campus eventually. Yes, that speakers is definitely a thing we want to do right now, but of course we don't have any money for that. So the um, we would just have savings that would be dedicated to those more complicated or more expensive ventures. And uh, what we want to use money for right now is to, frankly, pay for food, since we would like to incent people to come to the meetings just by making some food and cooking it and just saying, hey, uh, you want free lunch? Here it is. We'll just come here. We'll talk about some issues. And that's pretty much that. Okay. Um, so... Um... So let's move on to, you know, how how did you get involved with A Voice for Men? Um, I talked to Paul, and he told me you've involved with them for some time, and you play um, a pretty important role helping them along, uh, especially on the back end of their website, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, to be frank, uh, Google. <laughs> I found <laughs> A Voice for Men through Google. And um, But I was, I, I've been an MHRA for about, uh, since last December, December 5th to be exact, so I'm just about to hit my one year anniversary there. And um, I've been I've been going around and I've been looking at different men's rights organizations and I've, and I've known that there were some issues that I wanted to have addressed for a while, but when I was looking around I was thinking, well what exactly is going to make the most leeway as, as we move forward? What's going to get the issues noticed? And I noticed that A Voice for Men was much louder than the other organizations, very willing to talk about things and uh, get, get it out in the forefront, and I thought, you know what, I think this is the organization I would like to see grow. And so I went, I went to the uh, A Voice for Men forum, started chatting with people there, and I found out that uh, despite what people might say about the organization, that, is, that it's a hate group and all that, it's really, just very, uh, it's really just very provocative satire that they have on there, and the people behind it are actually pretty awesome. They're both men and women that come from all walks of life and all political uh, ideologies and they just come together and they talk about issues affecting men and boys and they will and they're very upfront about all of it. So that's how I got involved just through Google and just through mm -hmm. research on what I think will actually get the issues out and about and get people talking about it. Uh, when did you start like sort of formally helping them out with like their website and did Paul like approach you about doing that or? I um to be honest with you, I don't remember, but I can look that up for you. I actually keep a log of a lot of the stuff I do. If you just give me one second, I can actually pull up this kind of like resume thing I have on my site where I keep yeah, a log. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, just have this activism log thing. Uh, I became... I started by volunteering just as a forum moderator, which is a very, you know, low glamour gig where I you yeah. know, just make sure everybody follows the rules. I started that in, on April 7th, and... Then I became the assistant system administrator, which is the back end work on um, July 21st. All right. Uh, of this year or past year? This year. I've, okay. um, yeah, December 2012 was when I started everything before formal work. Um, okay. And let's see. Um, you know, what What sort of is your role going to be as you work with A Voice for Men to help other groups on, on other campuses get started up? Started up? <clears throat> I have just recently been named the Director of Collegiate Activism, and essentially my job description is to act as a liaison to uh, students that want to do essentially what I've done. There are going to be students that are going to be wondering, how do I get started? What's the direction I want to go in? How do I handle the politics? How do I stay in compliance with the law? It's a very nebulous, uncertain line of work. And since, I, since I've done it, and I've, I'm, I'm very meticulous in how I do everything, and uh, this has been noted, so I want to uh, make sure that students are motivated and, who, and understand the environment that they're in. So I, essentially my job is to be open for contact to these students and to give them all the information they need to go out and do what they need to do to get their stuff going. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess um, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. So like if there's like a new group um, on, you know, a different campus or, or a single student is mm -hmm. probably how it would go or a group of students who, who would want to get established and, and you um, got in touch with them or a voice for men put you in touch with them um, you know what what sort of day-to-day -day capacity would you would you play with them um, would you play in, in that case that's an excellent question because it's uh, so context-centric 
I imagine just from the get-go that there are going to be different policies on each campus and different state laws that these people have to that each individual student or group of students has to deal with and the jur jurisdictions have to be considered and frankly my commitment to helping each of these organizations would probably vary widely if there's a organization that's that's local to me and I can actually be in physical like in just in physical proximity of the group I would probably spend a lot more time helping them than say a uh, people who are wanting to start an organization in Australia there's a there's going it's just a matter of taking the time to actually research how the specific campus operates how the laws operate around them and to uh, and once I have the capacity to know what's going on I can help give these students more direction but the time that just varies so widely I couldn't give you a single number sure. um, you know uh, are there groups that are sort of getting on their feet um, Chris Thompson at MSU, who I spoke with, he, he mentioned Nolan Maddox and Mike Thompson, both, I believe, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, are looking to form a group or, or groups. Uh, but Chris said you would have a better idea than he would. I, and to, to be absolutely honest with you, I do not have the best idea in the world yet since, I again, I've only just been recently given the title and I'm still moving my research more toward this area. The only groups I'm really, uh, I, I've really been dedicating some time to right now are, say, Men's Rights Edmonton, and I have talked to Chris Thompson about the MSU group, mm -hmm. and um, I, a lot of my correspondence has been with, uh, say, Jonathan Taylor from A Voice for Male Students, and with uh, the folks at NCFM in order to understand more about how they wish to start their own groups. Mm -hmm. But I, I am, I have not been in contact with many, uh, I have not been in contact with many uh, individual groups or students simply because I have not had this title on at all. And um, I, I, frankly, I would be better able to answer your question if, if I had had the title for much longer. Sure. Yeah. I uh, know that makes sense. And and with that in mind, um, I know. Yeah, I, I do. I do apologize for not having no, much information now. But no, it's totally fine. I, I understand that you guys. This is like a, a very uh, nascent and sort of, you know, I imagine a lot of the definition will will come with time. Exactly. Um. So that being said, I mean, you know, I don't know to what extent you, you've spoken with Paul um, or sort of have in your own mind um, some specific goals or, or just general goals in terms of scale or, or long-term plans as director of collegiate activism. Um, I've been in close contact with Paul for several months. And our and my understanding is that we want to start establishing men's groups on college campuses because there's a lot of influence in uh, in terms of gynocentrism and misandry in our campuses and with people who have influence in say journalism and academia. And by establishing this representation on college campuses, we can help balance the narrative. And that's, it's just a, a very opportune place to actually put that representation since in other areas, say the media, it's much harder to get in. There's a very big barrier to entry. So mm -hmm. our activism on college campuses tends to get attention and I really can't argue with the results since, hey, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just some 22-year-old loser stuck in Georgia and here I am talking to somebody from the media right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he, like, he mentioned that... Um, you know, at least uh, he hopes that, you know, eventually there will be groups like this in colleges and, you know, in all 50 states. Um, you know, I don't know if you plan to stick around with them that long or sort of continue this work after you graduate, but um, have you thought about that? Well, I know that on KSU men, I'm going to be serving as an officer until uh, fall of next year. My term only lasts for one year. But I, I do plan to be an MHRA and a uh, staff member of A Voice for Men for a very long time. I am very happy with the organization and I want to see it succeed. And if for some reason something were to happen and I have to go out and work with other organizations, I would still be in you know, the sphere of NCFM and Men's Rights Edmonton. And I would still maintain a positive relationship with A Voice for Men even if I wasn't there anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I do plan to have continue my activism and... What specifically I would do, that varies because I am somebody that likes to make work for myself and I'm, I'm very independent in that way and I do a lot of self-starting. So I couldn't possibly predict the future about what's going to happen, but I can tell you that uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff happening over the years. Sure. Um, 
And then I just want to check, you know, I only know of, at least in the U.S., um, Canada, Australia aside, I only know of two recognized men's issues groups on college campuses, yours at, at KSU and then Chris Thompson at MSU. And I'm excluding folks like um, Dennis at Springfield College because they seem to follow a, a slightly different model, although I am talking to them. Um, are those the only two? Well, in terms of those that open up with this new interpretation of supporting men these are the these are the two that I am really aware of right now as well but there have all there have always been say groups that do masculinity studies or discuss issues affecting men they've been there before but they start with a different I guess you could say precedent a different interpretation of men's issues and they and they can they can be summarized essentially as, oh, well, men are suffering some issues, but they wouldn't be suffering if they weren't so violent. You know, just this very – the presumption of guilt, something that there's something wrong with men, and the attitude of uh, the MSU group and KSU men is more of men are just fine the way they are, and, and, and we start with the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. So it's a – when it comes to that, these are the only two that I really know of in the U.S. that have uh, gained some traction, and ha partly because A Force for Men has been publicizing the hell out of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, KSU Men, from what I understand, is the – it's the first – um, it's the first campus men's organization that started with from, that started with support from a voice for men that does not have the same kind of uh, gynocentric or misandric twist that uh, has been in other men's organizations beforehand. Um, and then, uh, you know, I know uh, a voice for men. I saw was able to help you raise a, a few hundred dollars um, pretty rapidly. I think you wanted like. 500 for your equipment and some of your tabling stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a sense of what that means that you can accomplish at, at other campuses? Does that question make sense? Uh, no. Could you rephrase it, please? Uh, sure. Um, so what I mean is, like, I imagine that that means, you know, that, that fundraising ability, that there are a lot of resources out there for potential on-campus groups, which obviously will need varied amounts of money. Some won't need any. Some might need some. Right. See I'm wondering if you have like a vague sense of how many groups AV, um, a voice for men's network, um, could help you seed. I'm still trying to think of the best way to approach the question, but I'm get. I, I do think that the resources are in the form of just supporters of a voice for men and the men's rights community that are really excited about these groups coming up. And frankly, all the donations that I got were from just individuals, just everyday people that are just really want this organization to be here. And they threw the money. At, at, they threw the money at KSU Men, and it's just uh, that's wonderful. And I'm assuming that um, any organization that is connected through the big organizations like NCFM, A Voice for Men, or even through um, or even those who go to KSU Men or Men's Rights Edmonton or the or uh, Chris Thompson's NCFM chapter. These, as long as those connections are there, it should be fairly easy to at least get somebody to make an announcement saying, "Hey, these guys want to start a group. Could you, you know, help them get their promotional materials, or maybe sign this petition, or what have you?" So mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I'm not going to go off and say that it's going to be easy as pie because, frankly, it took a lot of work for KSU Men to be founded. I start, it was really just started as a concept back in February, mm -hmm. and to. The fact that it was only found just about a, a week and a half ago is kind of telling of just how much work that has to be done in it. And it's uh, so I'm just going to say that the support is there. There is definitely support, but that does not mean that it's going to be easy. Sure. Um, and then, you know, tell me if I'm sort of uh, off base with this question, because I don't know if a voice for men or a national coalition for men ever um, uses resources to become active on behalf of specific people to provide legal aid for people or, I don't know, to, to help people travel to rallies like the one you were at on Friday. Um, I, yeah, I, I have to be, I have to be, of course, kind of careful with questions like these because I do not wish to share anything internal about finances. Mm -hmm. um, but all I can say is that A Voice for Men, whenever, it, A Voice for Men is certainly a very expensive organization to run because, you know, they're big servers to maintain since there's so many people attending the site. 
there's recording studios to maintain because people do radio shows and get their videos up and all that. So there's just a lot of stuff to actually keep up and running from the fundraisers alone. And there, there is, there, there is some. They do try whenever they can to make sure that somebody could say, ha, ha, get tr get themselves transported to an event if, if again they can afford it. And mm -hmm. uh, a voice for men has been very supportive in those ways. And in terms of KSU men. Um, Paul has been uh, nice enough to allow me to uh, post my fundraiser on a Voice for Men, which of course costs a Voice for Men money in some ways because people, instead of donating to a Voice for Men, they notice my fundraiser first and they start donating to that. So it, it, it gives allowances where it can without trying to uh, dig into what's necessary to keep the organization running. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and I ask just because it occurred to me that um, – it's something that if if they do that, they could eventually be doing on behalf of college men who you know appear wrongfully accused uh, or wrongfully detained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, I don't want to I don't want to be commenting too much on what a voice for men would do if it had the money because frankly I don't have the power to make any of those calls. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so it occurs to me, and you know, I'm sure you know, and I've seen from from reading about you guys and and reading some of the things that you um, opt to respond to that, like the two big sort of like the, I guess like the two main responses um, I could see to you know some of what you want to accomplish or some of the general things that you um, want to speak about is you know obviously um, when men's rights groups. Uh, speak about um, rape or, or sexual assault on campuses, um, sort of in that college context, mm -hmm. uh, it it becomes very controversial. Um, you know, I, I've, I've heard a few of you guys sort of reference the fact that there aren't very many rapes reported on your campus, and of course the sort of the natural response I see from people to that is that rape is a, is a very underreported crime. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other big one is... And I wish I could tell you off the top of my head where I read this, but I've seen various incarnations of, of people sort of responding to some of the issues that you raise is uh, they get the sense sort of in, in tone or implication that, um, you know, you see uh, some of these men's issues coming about, uh, you know, sort of at the, maybe I have this backwards, that... Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just totally lost it. No, 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 um, no. It, it, it's it's okay. Uh, sort of crop up um, at the expense of, of women's success or or certain women's rights, and those are sort of the two. Yeah. Big, um, and so you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. Yeah. I, what I like what I like to do is go ahead and just put some distinctions out there to make it easier to understand what we do and how we're not trying to go out and hurt anybody. The first distinction is the distinction between a gender centrist and a human rights specialist. A gender centrist would be somebody who would focus on a single gender identity to the exclusion of all others. And a human rights specialist would be somebody who would start from generalized humanist principles and then specialize in a demographic simply with the understanding that no one can save the world. And it takes tremendous time and money just to even focus on one demographic. So the um, the distinction is sometimes hard for people to see because sometimes people would say see something like an organization that's out to help men or an organization that's out to help Latinos or an organization that's out to help women or so on and so forth. And they would assume that people would find that demographic more important than the others, which but that's not necessarily true. A KSU men is not does not take any position that any women's rights advocacy groups or women's uh, you know programs are inherently bad. It doesn't think they're bad at all. I I would say that uh, our position would be any women's programs that would do something at the expense of men is bad because that is essentially misandric or gynocentric. But there's a new organization on uh, KSU that's been starting up called Women in Technology. It's you know a branch of a much larger the, a much larger woman in technology, I believe. And so far, I have not seen that organization do anything that was harmful to men, and they've been very, uh, they've, they're being successful in promoting women in STEM fields. Similarly, there's another organization called Kennesaw Women in Mathematics, does something very similar. They promote women's participation in mathematics, but I have not done, seen them do anything anti male. So I am very happy that these organizations are there. 
and I'm very happy that they're doing what they're doing. And uh, I would only take issue with, say, gender studies courses that would presume on the guilt of men, would say that men are violent, and would presume that men have to be essentially trained, almost like chimps, to, um, be, to be conditioned to not be violent potential rapists. It's very insulting. So um, we, when we start these organizations and we question that kind of thing, people would very quickly categorize us into those kinds of organizations that would oppose women's programs. But that, again, that's just not, that's just not true. We're just, we're just very, um, there's just some ways where the, there's a lot of overlap, as you can see, and there can be a lot of miscommunication. So by understanding the distinction between gender centrism and human rights spe specializations, it becomes a little easier to see if somebody is acting in a way that is harming somebody else. Um, but your question was uh, still, still, I feel like I could answer your question in a more complete way. Could you please restate it briefly so I could give you another dimension to it? Sure. So um, it wasn't really a question, it was, <laughs> um, which I think is part of the trouble. Um, it, you know, it was more just, um, you know, I, I tried to paraphrase um, with economy, which I did not do. <laughs> um, the sort of like the sort of the two uh, general objections I have seen to your guys' um, sort of uh, philosophy and, and your guys' efforts. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the first of those is, um, you know, that... Uh, I mean, it comes in sort of different forms, but it uh, all sort of has to do with um, uh, sexual violence on campus and, um, you know, how, how I, I guess some feminists uh, feel that you, um, that men's rights groups and men's issues groups sort of downplay that as an issue. Um, and sort of... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess like it sort of it sort of defies summary because they you know they have a lot of responses to. Well, it, I think that um, given the way you've stated it, there's so many possible ways that people could disagree and interpret the actions of one another that it's very hard to actually bring about a single, um, I guess, a single worldview to kind of organize it all into neat little boxes. But um, I think one way I can help you make sense of it, uh, another way I can help you make sense of it is so I, I can tell you a little bit about some of my personal experience. And I do know it's not good form to be sharing anecdotes as evidence, but I'm only telling you this just so you can have some context. Oh, when, yeah. Yeah, when I was on, uh, I was a student of Georgia State University for, um, I think back in spring of last year. Yeah, spring of last year. And um, I was in a global politics class, and there the teacher was sharing... Uh, statistics such as women do two-thirds of the world's work for 10% of the income and 1% of the world's property. And I looked on the Atlantic saw, and saw refutation of that statistic, and I questioned that statistic, and I also mentioned that um, in response to a student's complaint about women's problems, that men essentially suffer their own problems too. And my intention behind stating something like that is the fact that I'm really, I'm really worried when somebody changes the rhetoric to make it sound like two demographics can't relate, as if if so, if somebody suffers one thing, the other can't possibly know, can't possibly empathize, and can't possibly sympathize. I feel that's dangerous because it shuts down discussions and and breeds distrust. So when I stated simply that men and women suffer because hatred and discrimination is a hum, part of the human condition. That alone got people very, very upset with me, I'm mm. to the point where they're banging on desks, to the point where they're getting, just giving me evil looks. And when I left the class that day, some people followed me out and uh, insulted me, my intelligence and just gave me a very hard time. And I think that this is one of those, this is one of those things where even if you take a very non-controversial statement, such as, men's rights are human rights because men's are, men are human beings, or say something like, men suffer too, if that alone can stir up such a huge uh, angry hornet's nest, it gives you an idea of, I think, uh, the justification for men's issues groups on campuses. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, again, I wish I could summarize my answer for you too, but it is hard to summarize because it's one of those deals where 
it has to do with cultural attitudes. It has to do with trying to uh, interject, uh, assert a point in the, in the greater conversation and sorting out those who would act, you know, in a hateful manner or would actually just be defending a demographic in a right and just way. And uh, again, with that distinction I gave you earlier, it's easier to sort out those two kinds of people. Yeah. And, you know, again, um, yeah, I don't mean to ask you to sort of um, rebut the whole of, uh, you know, objections to the concept of men's rights issues. Um, so I, I hope I didn't make you feel as though. No, no. no I'm pl- I, and I, I do. I do welcome you to challenge me because, frankly, that keeps me on my toes. <laughs> um, and, and so I think one thing I can do is sort of, um, you know, think about things in our conversation. So, <clears throat> excuse me so far. Um, so, for instance, you know, you mentioned um, that at Kennesaw State in uh, the last uh, a certain number of years, um, you know, which I'll remember when I go back and I, I transcribe our recording, mm-hmm. um, you know, that there had only been one reported rape. And, and he sort of said that um, by, by way of uh, explaining why you know, maybe uh, all the resources and, and attention to the problem of rape on campus was uh, a little bit of an overreaction or, or teaching men uh, their defense class, you know, the way that they did um, mm-hmm. was, was an overreaction. Um, yeah, and, I, you know, I, I've, I've heard other people say that and sort of point to low instances of rape and, and sort of the, the common feminist um, reply is that rape is a really underreported crime. Sure. Um, I, I guess what I can comment on that is that when, when we discuss numbers involving rape, it's always a very nebulous. Uh, uh, it's always a very nebulous thing. Police often have trouble getting the facts sorted out in these cases, and even and, and rape could very and rape is oftentimes very underreported. But I would say for both sexes, and you could easily imagine the scenario in both. And one example being, a woman might be afraid of reporting a rape simply because she's scared stiff. And a uh, man would be afraid of reporting a rape because he's afraid of the social backlash and his uh, deviance from a uh, his his deviation rather from male roles that he's been pressured into by society, and you know being the tough guy or so on. Mm-hmm. And it's it's one of those deals where I really don't like it when people get into a conversation where it sounds like they need to show that they are suffering more by making suffering a competition. I think that politics has gone to a very dark place if people can get authority and a conversation just by looking weaker than the other person. I think that's a very unhealthy way of looking at things and it cannot be and that competition cannot possibly be won without downplaying some some demographic suffering. So let let it be known right now that I would not in any way endorse, say, um, tr- treating somebody suffering as somehow less important than another's. However, I would say that when talking about men's issues, we often say, hey, they exist. And by saying, hey, they exist, the fact that that, again, the fact that that alone is controversial is kind of worrisome. Now, um, so I, so you, uh, just so I, I guess I would wrap this up by saying we're not out to downplay anybody's real suffering. That's not our intention. We are, however, going to be pointing out suffering that we have neglected that we as a society have neglected. And when somebody in some way questions it or accuses us of downplaying somebody else's suffering just by pointing out the existence Mm -hmm. of a demographic suffering, that's just, I I just think that's a problem. We we Mm -hmm. need to be, I I really do think that uh, if domestic violence shelters, for example, if that support is very sparse for men, even though um, there has been research showing a greater gender symmetry of domestic violence between the sexes, I think that, again, we're looking at a very big problem where we're seeing neglect for the issues affecting men and boys. And by pointing them out, we do not aim to take anything away from women. That's not our goal. But we want to make sure that there's representation for men. That's where it ends. Um, What got you interested in men's rights issues? Well, um, man, I could come back to you with a life story on that one. my, you know, you know that show Curb Your Enth- Enthusiasm with Larry David. Sure. I feel like I've walked onto the set of that. It's a, uh, I've spent a lot of time being in the room 
with fights. I had no idea how I got in, how I got into them. Um, so let's see. Um, and I, I think you sort of, um, put this on hold while you're working with, uh, KSU men. Um, but I see that you, uh, you used to blog as, as Victor Zen on WordPress. Oh, I, I still, I still write under Victor Zen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, I, I, I'm public with my name now. You may freely refer to me as Sage Gerard and I don't like that. Um, I just, uh, a lot of MHRAs uh, know me as Victor Zen, and they're more mm -hmm. comfortable referring to me as Victor Zen. Sure. So I, I keep, I tend to keep the names like together. Yeah, um, I'm curious, what made you uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, choose that name. It sounds cool. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Um, uh, and uh, that that site is is everything on that site. Your writing and and your cartoons and. I saw that you did like some posters for for various campaigns at some point. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm very provocative with that stuff. Uh, yes, that's all mine. Um, yeah, and well, and yeah, I've, um, uh, since you brought it up, um, you know, some of those cartoons and blog posts, you know, I I would see as as being things that would really incense feminists in in ways I'm sure that you can imagine. Um, right. I I can I can provide some context behind that if you'd like. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. The, the essentially the marketing strategy of a voice for man and my, a voice for man and myself is to be impossible to ignore and to and to essentially bring up and bring up these pieces in a way where people start talking and the way we've experienced these issues is such that when when you bring up men's issues it they tend to be in a way as I mentioned before neglected they tend to be very hard to bring up and I'm sure you can imagine that even just a few years ago, men's issues were just kind of this thing that were that people would talk about in a back room for ten minutes and then not bring up again for years. And it's it's a very uh, un, under discussed issue. And we do our position is that we live in a gynocentric culture and such such that when we focus on the issues affecting women, it's kind of expected and deviating from the norm of focusing on women is seen as kind of like a heresy. And um, it's, it doesn't have to be in any way hateful toward women to change the focus. It doesn't have to be that way at all. But that's how, in our experience, that's how it's seen. So what we've done is we've we've taken on this provocative satire in order to, uh, because we know that's the thing that won't be ignored. We know that's what people will actually come out and say, hey, um, though it's very polarizing, right? Some people either strongly agree with it or strongly disagree with it. And our tactic, most often than not, is to present the satire in such a way where we would see the kind of uh, hateful narrative against men that uh, out in, in publications or in the, in the media and academia, we would flip the sexes and present that same kind of hateful narrative in, that, in a satirical light. So it's kind of like a glorified mirror, a funhouse mirror of society. And there have been times where we would put this stuff up and people would say, hey, this is really sexist. And they're like, and, and, we, and we would say something like, yeah, you know, if we actually meant this, it would be sexist. But only when we flip the sexes did you see the sexism. So that satire is a very important uh, tool for us to get, get ourselves noticed. And we do not want to come off as just the, we don't want to come off as just the next set of internet trolls because there it really is a method to the madness. And um, so the context behind all of it is we've tried being nice before, and frankly, it hasn't worked. Now, once we get men's issues more mainstream, once people in, in the academia and in the media talk about men's issues more, I think you'll find that we will calm down pretty quickly. <laughs> so it's it's um, the, the satirical and very, and, and, and I will even admit it, intentionally offensive pieces that you will see on these sites are there for the specific purpose of getting people talking. And once people start talking, you'll see us toned down. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, let's see. I, You know, I think that's sort of the run of my questions, and you've been really generous with your time. Um, so I guess I would just close by asking if, if there's anything that you would really like to emphasize uh, to me or, you know, anything you would really like to make sure I, I take away from our conversation? Uh, sure. I, I'm going to ad lib this, so forgive me if I sound like I'm rambling, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Um, 
men's issues are we're seeing a new wave of human rights activism. We're seeing a new movement. And frankly, one thing to remember about movements is that they consist of organizations and individuals that oftentimes act in sometimes contradictory ways in pursuit of some common goal. And the men's human rights movement is going to be a very important force going forward. And I will even state with, from my experience that I've seen men's rights activists from, again, all walks of life and all ideologies from men and women, different religious backgrounds, and I even have seen um, my share of misogynists and flat-out flat crazy people. And we know about the various risks that are being taken in growing the movement. We make sure to disassociate from anybody who would actually endorse hatred, uh, even though that there are some that would say that we in somehow endorse, say, rape culture or violence against women, which we don't. But we use this provocative satire. We use this very open and and, and, sometime, and sometimes righteously angry language in order to get the conversation going. So for those who are sitting on the sidelines and who do not understand either, or rather who do not identify with either, say, feminism or the men's human rights movement, understand that you, that you are seeing a, a, a new adaption that's trying to even out the narrative. And once we reach a state of equilibrium, I think society will end up better off as a result of it. Well, thank you so much. Um, thanks for that, and uh, thanks for giving me, you know, an hour of your time in a busy week. I really appreciate it. And I do appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, and I'm very happy that uh, we had this conversation. And um, you do, again, you do have my permission to use my real name, and uh, you may also distribute the recording as you wish, um, I, with the understanding that the little part where we talk about my father's clipped out, if it's public. Okay, yeah, I don't intend to distribute this at all. Um, now, I, I, I do, um, now I would like to ask you, I've, I have been recording this too, just um, as I mentioned I would, and uh, I would like to publish uh, excerpts of it on YouTube, or rather, actually all of it, just with the dad part removed. Would you mind that? Um, let's see. Uh, I, from my understanding that, uh, I, I do understand that this, it, that my recording is my own intellectual property, so I do intend to publish it, but I want to know if there's anything that you would not like to have shared in this conversation. Sure. Um, you know, the only reason I hesitate is I just started at Mother John, so I don't know if they have, like, any, I, like, I don't imagine they would have a Problem. Well, I, I, I think that the recording that you have, that you're recording right now, is um, the property of Mother Jones, and I'm under the assumption that the recording... Yeah, and, and yours is yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, would, you, um, would you like give me a little bit of time just to notify my editors that that's the case? Yeah, I, w I, 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 wish to, uh, publish the, my, I wish to publish my recording, and all I would like to know is, uh, frankly, if there's anything that you would not like to have mentioned in this, in this interview. But I really do intend to publish like the whole thing minus the dad part. If you don't want your name mentioned or anything, I can bleep that out. Um, no, I think that should be fine, um, you know, as long as I have a day or so to uh, let my editors know that that's going to be the case, um, then I don't think there should be uh, an issue with it. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I'll go ahead and let it go for a couple of days, and I'm just going to go ahead and publish it. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Um, uh, I don't know when we're going to publish an article. It'll be within a week or so. Okay. Uh, that actually, yeah, now that I think about it, and I'm foolish for not thinking about that before, um, yeah, I mean, that that would be just uh, because um, it would not be advantageous for me to have the recording out there um, for, you know, other people who are in my same line of work to come across and, uh, you know, hear answers to. Um, and, you know... Uh, so, you know, if you would make that consideration, um, I'd be thankful for that, but that would be my only concern. Uh, uh, would, it, would there be a better time to release the recording that would be uh, less of a problem for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, sort of uh, concurrent with the um, article or, you know, as I'm wrapping it up. And I think, you know, unless there's um, sort of, some sort of big issue. I think that should be this week or, or early next so, week. Uh, so I can go ahead and publish my thing on YouTube when the article comes out. 
I think that should work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I do this for completeness so that the sure. so that yeah, no, uh, there, 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 there have been there have been in, instances where MHRAs would interview um, a media outlet that's frankly already decided that we're a bunch of pricks. And uh, when they say if they say something that misrepresents our position, these recordings help make sure that the facts are out there. And, sure. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I saw that you you know you published your exchange with what was uh, it the USA Today or US News. Um, right. So yeah, no, I, I I don't really have a problem with it. I sort of anticipated that you would ask. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would like um, to just yeah. I'll, 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 I'll wait. I'll wait until the article is up so that um, oh. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sage. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to speak with me, Molly. I hope I've been to help. Yep, take care. All right, bye-bye.